hope you all had a nice lunch, very healthy, nice and colourful. More colours are, more colours on your plate is a good thing, as you all know. Um, so I'm Tara Shine. I've worked on climate change for over 20 years. So when none of you were talking about it, I was banging on about it. So I'm really glad that you're all interested and here to figure out how we can work together. And what can we all do to get more action on climate change at the local level? Climate action, although we need international laws to guide us on it and we need national policy and legislation really badly, inherently most climate action is local in nature. Um, and so it really means that you have a very, very important role to play and the leadership you give is going to be critical to how we shape the next 10 years. And it's all about the next 10 years in terms of what we pass on to future generations, um, in terms of the opportunities that we're going to give young people today to grow up with the same opportunities, the same natural resources that we enjoyed throughout our life. So, this is just a little dash around the world in the week of the 9th of November 2019. So, fires were raging through New South Wales and Queensland in Australia. Many of us in Ireland have family there. Many of us have family who were uh, at risk, who were fearful for their homes. Those fires rage on today. They have reached the coast. They've destroyed two thirds of the, the forest in New South Wales, but they have made you know, internal refugees of people within Australia, um, people who are forced out of their homes and are having to stay with relatives um, and are wondering how they're going to rebuild. So in that same week that Australia was being ravaged by unprecedented wildfires caused by high temperatures and extremely dry land, Venice was flooded. 85% of Venice was underwater. It was a one in 50 year flood. Venice is subsiding and at the same time sea level is rising due to climate change. Sea level rise is predicted to be between 60 centimetres and a metre by 2050. That matters to all of us if we live here in Dublin or Cork or in any coastal town in Ireland. Um, because a higher, higher sea level accompanied by a high tide, accompanied by a storm is only going to bring more water into our low lying areas um, and that poses us all a risk. <coughs> Still in the same week, these were the floods in England. And um, we had over a thousand properties evacuated in the area of Fish Lake. Um, so it doesn't matter where you live. When I used to show slides like this, even five to 10 years ago, I was reliant on examples from Malawi and Bangladesh. And it was hard for Irish people to connect to them because it all seemed so far away. But these are places we know. This is a, a friend of mine who's a farmer in Limerick. And in 2018, we had Storm Emma with all of that snow, which meant that we had a very late spring. That snow came just as he had all his new calves. So we had to find sheds and safe places for them to be out of the, out of the snow. We then had a very late spring, and then we had a drought in the summer, which led to the fodder crisis that many of you will remember. And what that meant is that our farmers, including our, our successful large-scale dairy farmers were highly vulnerable and at risk to, to these impacts of climate change, which we had been told were coming. But what this meant is that Sean and his wife, Michelle, woke up every morning that summer to the cows and bawling in the yard, bawling with hunger. And you know what they could get to feed them? Palm nut kernel from Malaysia. Yeah, it's the only thing they could buy to feed them. And at the same time that Michelle, my eco-conscious warrior friend, wife of Sean, was trying to get him not to buy Nutella in Tesco because it's got palm oil in it, he's like, love, what do you think we're feeding the cows? Yeah? So we are going to, there's a risk. This is, not going to new, this is not going to be exceptional in the future. We're going to have struggles around how are we going to come through fodder crisis. We're going to have more droughts in the summer. We're going to have wetter winters. At the moment, we're about to lose a significant proportion of our potato crop due to flooding in the northwest of the country. So the ground is so waterlogged that the potatoes are rotting in the soil. At a time where already over 70% of our potatoes are imported in Ireland. And all we want to be able to buy when we go to the shop is an Irish potato, not in a plastic bag. That's most of us are trying to find. So climate change is not something distant. It's not something that lives on a graph. It is not something for atmospheric scientists or for environmental scientists like me. Climate change is for everyone that you represent. Whether they're a small business owner, a farmer, a 
kid at school or a young person trying to decide where they're going to go to university or college or what they want to do next in their lives. This is for all of us. You know, likewise, here's a business in Kinsale, where I live. Um, just here is the Bullman Hotel, or the Bullman Bar and Restaurant. So when we get storms like this, which was Storm Ophelia, the Bullman has to close for a number of days. The, damage, the property gets damaged. The road got completely damaged. When you have a road that's damaged, if someone needs an ambulance, the, road can't get, the, the ambulance can't get through. So that person can't get the help they need. They can't get to hospital. This is practical, everyday stuff that you guys do in councils all the time. Yeah, climate change is a just, it's just another layer of risk that we have to manage, and it's another, another part of policy change that we have to make. But it is very much part of the bread and butter of what you already do as councillors and decision makers within your communities. So this is what we have to do. Our emissions keep growing. Look at 2010 to 2017, and the latest research came out just last week from the World Meteorological Organization and the Environment Agency of the United Nations. Our emissions, instead of going down, are still going up. It's not just Ireland, it's all over the world. Our emissions are still going up, despite the commitments, but despite all we've learned. So what we have to do is really with a conscious, conscious effort start to push our emissions down. We get, need to get to zero emissions. So by 2050, we need to be balancing the emissions that we produce of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases with the amount of carbon dioxide that we're sucking up through our, through our soils, through our trees, through the way that we manage our wild spaces and our biodiversity, as you were talking about this morning. But we have to make this transition in the next 10 years. The world is already warmed by one degree from when we started to burn coal back in the Industrial Revolution. We can only warm another half degree or we start to pass tipping points of no return. And what does that mean? That means, yeah, we won't have any more coral reefs, like just casually, more than 1.5 degrees, no more coral reefs. If we have more than 1.5 degrees of warming, we won't be able to grow enough food to feed 7 billion people, let alone the 9 billion people we're going to have by 2050. If we, do, if we let the warming grow past 1.5 degrees, we will have mass migration. And we will pass these tipping points, which are things like when glaciers melt, whole glaciers in Greenland and release all that fresh water into the system. And we actually don't know accurately how that will affect the natural systems that keep this planet livable. We don't actually know how that will affect us. We really don't want to experiment with it and try and find out. So this is, the, this is the change we have to make. And what's very clear is two degrees, which we used to think was safe, that we could warm by two degrees. We can't. That's not safe. We actually have to keep warming to 1.5 degrees, which means we have to work even harder at changing our economic systems, shifting them away from fossil fuels and onto renewable, renewable alternatives. So this is, those are, this is from two of the reports that I showed you. This red line is the increases in carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So someone said to me today, why is carbon bad? You know, carbon, it's a naturally occurring element. Why is it bad? So carbon dioxide, which is primarily released when we burn fossil fuels, when it goes up into the atmosphere, it, causes, it, ca it creates a warming layer. It traps the heat, just like a greenhouse, in around planet Earth. Okay? And that means that it warms. And that carbon dioxide, when we put it up there, it doesn't stay up there for a year or two years. It stays up there for hundreds of years. So when we put it up there, we lock in that warming for years and years. Some schools all want to be these things happen. The lead for your leadership has never been greater on these issues. So, number one, the alternative to the way that Mr. Trump leads, President Trump, I guess I should call him President Trump, please, is a form of collaborative leadership. Collaborative leadership is based on a common purpose. It is not to make me more famous. It is not to make me more powerful. It says, what does our community need? What does my county or my city need? What is our purpose? What do we need together? And then, and it, and it forms that opinion not by somebody at the top deciding, but through a consultative process, through a process of open um, conversation. Collaborative leadership knows when good is not good enough. And this is really important in the area of climate and the environment, for where for a long time, perfect has been our problem. We sold people the idea that if you didn't live in the countryside on your own plot of land, growing all of your own food with your own solar panels, creating all of your energy, you weren't green. No, you can be green and live in an apartment block. You can be green and live in a terrace house. You're probably more green because you probably drive your car less. So we have to get away from the idea that perfect is the only way. We need to do good things and do many good things really fast. That's what we need to do. 
And collaborative leadership requires a lot of humility. You have to be humble. You have to know when to ask for help. A lot of people in our communities aren't volunteering because nobody asked them to. Nobody said, will you help me with this? Nobody said, you have really good skills in web design. Will you help me create a website for our local project? We don't ask, okay? But these pe many people feel, say to me, you know, oh, I'm in a community, but I haven't found my way in yet. And I, and, and I just wish someone would ask me or tell me how I could help. So collaborative leadership, a completely different style of leadership from, from Donald Trump, right? We, we really need to go to the polar opposites. This is about how we bring everybody up with us, not how I rise up by standing on everybody else. Sorry to pick on him, but I know that my eight-year-old kid understands him, so he's a really good um, you know, emblem for what I think we don't need in the world. Number two, really important, the message and the messenger. In Ireland up until now, the message around environment has become out of the mouth of a very small number of us. So you'll have heard Michael, you'll have heard John Sweeney, you'll have heard Ushie and Coughlin, over and over again, a small number of us, right, that speak for these issues. And we only influence a very small number of people who think that they see themselves in us or for some reason value our opinion. The most impactful messengers are your peers. They're the people you sit with when you go for a coffee. They're the, peop they're the mums and dads that you meet at the school gate. They're the people you play golf with. These are the people that influence us and that we, lead, that we listen to. So what we need to do is create a conversation in Ireland where the messages around climate change and climate action come from our peers. They come from those that we already trust. We're not reliant only on messages coming from government and government-sponsored um, messaging or campaigns on the TV. This has to be a national conversation. And the message has to be appealing to me. So telling me that I need to stop driving my car because it will save four tonnes of um, of emissions isn't going to work. Nobody cares about emissions, right? Sorry, environmental scientists, nobody cares about emissions. If you tell me I'll get out of my car, I'll save money, I'm interested. If you tell me I'll lose weight, if you tell me I'll get fit, if you tell me I'll get my Fitbit to do the 10,000 sooner in the day, I might be interested, yeah? But I will not be interested if you just tell me it's about emissions. So never, ever, ever lead a conversation that you have in your community or in your work about climate change with an environmental message. Imagine me coming and slapping you on the back of the head and saying, no points for that. You have to lead with it, a social message or an economic message. So what's in it for me? That's all we, we care about as human beings. We have, to, we have to help our colleagues and friends to see how this kind of action on environment is good for them because it will improve their health. It will improve our air quality. It will create new jobs. It will mean that down the line we get to work a four day week. Yeah, it's going, to have it's going to have impacts on all of these things. The third thing to think about is that we're actually in the business now of not, in many cases, building something or creating something or funding something. We're in the business of changing behavior. And changing behavior is hard. Does anybody have a habit they wish they could break? Yeah? It's hard, right? Human beings were hardwired to repeat a habit. So in order to change behavior, we can't just stick up a sign or create a law. It's not enough in and of itself. We have to give people the capacity. We have to give them the knowledge and the information that they need. We need to be honest with them about the scale of the problem, but then we need to arm them with things that they can do. We need to give them opportunity. We have to give leadership. We need the right national policies, the right local policies, laws, the right plans. We need the right infrastructure. So they need EV chargers, and they need better public transport, and they need access to local food. But if we do those things and we don't tap into the motivation, so what is it are the values? What are the core values you're tapping into for me? Why should I care? What is it for me? Do I care because I'm a fisherman? Do I care because I have grandkids? Why do I care? And you have to tap into that and help me to understand why this is going to be important to me. So the last time I stood in this room was 2015. And it was at a conference organized by the then minister, Alan Kelly, uh, about a smoky coal ban and about making the smoky coal ban nationwide. And it was imminent, the ban, in 2015. On Monday, the, the air pollution levels in Cork City were higher than anywhere in the rest of Europe. Yeah, we still haven't done anything. Now, is that smoky coal ban about going head to head with the coal lobby? Is it about um, reducing emissions? No, it's about, air. It's about us and our, the quality of the air that we breathe and the fact that 1,180 people die annually in Ireland from air pollution. That's why we should care about that. That's the value, that's the inspiration. My health, 
Yeah? Not because Alan Kelly said he would do it, not because we should do it, not because it's good for the environment, but because for me, I don't want my kid with asthma to suffer any more than they have to. And the fourth thing, the way we do community action and the way we do partnership, we have to be open to tearing that up and starting again. So having committees that meet at 7 o'clock on a Thursday and wondering why it's only the same four people that come, this is because we live in a world where people are so time poor that even if they're really committed, they're not going to get there. So when are we going to, how are we going to organize meetings? How are we going to use the internet? How are we going to use apps? How are we going to adjust the time frames and the ways that we engage people in community level decision making so that they're able to come? Because what we have right around the place now, and you can tell me this better than I can, is we have aging committees where there's an impossibility to get volunteers to come and replace them because people are too busy. We're all too time poor. So we're going to have to be ready to tear it up and start again. This slide is of an initiative that um, I run, uh, well, I helped to co-found. It's run by all of us in the community in Kinsale called Plastic Free Kinsale. And Plastic Free Kinsale was about reducing the use of single-use plastics in Kinsale and increasing awareness and increasing choice away from single-use plastics in the town. And what we did very consciously when we created Plastic Free Kinsale is we didn't create a new entity and we created, didn't create a new committee at all. And what we said was we would only work through what existed there already. And when I listened to the reports back earlier, I had many of these stakeholders come up. So we worked through business, through the Chamber of Tourism and Commerce, through every hotel, cafe, small office in the town. We worked through schools. We went in and engaged with every single one of them. We worked through clubs and societies, the untapped power of Ireland. If people are volunteering, they're doing it in the GAA and the soccer and the scouts and all of these and in the tidy towns. Don't ask them to volunteer again. Go and get them to do the action on climate change in their existing volunteer role with the tidy towns, with the soccer, with the GAA. And the fourth thing we did is we engaged with people in their homes because a lot of people are stuck in their home, minding their kids, too busy to get out. And so we did that on social media. And what I, what I know is there are, that is not the perfect model, but I learned a lot from it. And I know that we have huge potential in finding new ways to engage people that will never identify as green, that don't even know if they feel part of the same community that you associate them with. Because there's different communities within a community and we have different friendship groups within communities. Assuming everybody feels part of the community, it can often be an assumption too far. Um, this, you will hear often, or sure, what does it matter what I do? Sure, you know, if everybody doesn't do it, it doesn't make a difference. Or if Ireland does it and China and India don't do it, what's the point? The truth of the matter is we're at a point now where every individual action does count. It can't just be individual action. We need systemic change. It has to be at the level of governments. It has to be the level of multinational businesses. But my theory of change is this. If we don't change the conversation amongst all these human beings, in Ireland, the everyday conversations we're having on the radio, the everyday conversations we're having at the kitchen table, at the bar, in the cafe, we don't actually create enough awareness to get um, political change, systemic change and policy change. So changing the conversation through people's individual actions is really, really important. So I see it a little bit like this, that the more that we engage people and communities in talking about solutions to climate change, realizing that we're, this is all about creating a better future. It's not about putting us back into the dark ages. It's about better quality housing. It's about better quality air. It's about better quality of life and better jobs. But the more we create this conversation, the more we get support to take the brave measures that we need to do to change the system. And if we're gonna change this system in 10 years and do so in a way that is fair and just to everybody, we need to be having everybody at the table and hearing all the voices from the farmers to the turf cutters to the urban dwellers. So what are we in right now? We're in a marketing campaign. Yeah? Um, this very wise lady called Grace Hopper, who was clearly a, an exception because she was a, both a Navy Admiral and a computer scientist, although she was alive in the early 1900s, uh, she said people are allergic to change. We have to get out there and sell the idea. And what we're in the business of, you, me, all of us right now, is we have to get out there and sell the idea that the change we need to make is for the better. And believe me, it, it will be and it is for the better. So thank you. Uh, and if you want hints and tips on what you can do in your own life, if you want videos to watch or share with your colleagues, if you want advice in your council on what you can do, then feel free to contact us in Change by Degrees. Thank you.